Hello and welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Mike Wigand. You're joining me for our Genesis Bible study entitled Creation, the Flood, the Fall, and the Fallout. We are looking at Lesson 9. We are exploring the lives of Isaac and Rebekah, Isaac being the son of Abraham. We'll begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we delve into your word, we ask that you would open our hearts to receive it and to apply it in our lives. Help us to learn from the people in front of us in the book of Genesis. Help us to learn of your love from the book of Genesis. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I said, we're starting lesson nine. We're going to take a look now at the life of Abraham's son, Isaac, the one given to Abraham and Sarah in their very old age. And sadly, we're going to see that in Isaac's life, some of the same thing, things and same sins that Abraham struggled with become evident in the life of his son. And thus the title of the lesson, The Sins of the Fathers. Genesis 26, 1 through 16, you can grab your Bible and read along. Now there was a famine in the land besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you. Stay in the land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands, and through your offspring all nations will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, and my decrees and my laws. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she's my sister. Because he was afraid to say she is my wife, he thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she's really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? And Isaac answered, Because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, What is this you've done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, Anyone who molests this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that land the same year, reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug at the time of Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You've become too powerful for us. Boy, there's some familiar sounding words and stories there, aren't there? We look and right away we, we see the fallout from the sin of Abraham's life show itself in the life of Isaac. You remember when Abraham is in Egypt and he's avoiding the famine and he's worried, well, they'll think my wife is beautiful and they'll want her, so they'll kill me and take her into my harem. And he had her lie and say she's my sister. Well, Isaac does the exact same thing, doesn't he? What does that tell you about Isaac? Sinful, sinful in a way that's so hurtful to instead of fulfilling your role to put it all on your wife, to put her in a vulnerable position just to save your own skin. Same thing that we saw in Abraham and we see it in Isaac too, and the Bible doesn't gloss it over. This is a serious thing. This is a rotten thing that Isaac does. Next question. Based on Abraham's similar behavior, poor treatment of wives to save one's own skin seems to be a sin that had become culturally, sorry, prevalent. What seems to be, what's the added danger when a sin becomes prevalent in a family or a culture? You think about the, the case with Isaac, and while he wasn't there, he wasn't born when Abraham did this, we don't even know, did he know that Abraham did this? But the point is, it seems to be something that's culturally prevalent, maybe even 
culturally acceptable that you treat your your wives in this way. And those cultural sins, the the problem with them, the, the way they really catch us is over time when they're repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, you just don't treat them as sins anymore. And that seems to be one of the things that's happened here. Well, nobody is in that I know is going to take me to task for this. Nobody is going to arrest me for this. I'm not going to get in trouble for this. Everyone else is doing it, so I'll do it too. But what did that say to Rebecca? I, I have the next question. It's one where we do some applying now. Some of the sins that have become prevalent in our culture or what we see often becoming prevalent in families. Would you agree that makes it doubly hard to stop the sinful behavior? You, you, you think about what becomes prevalent. I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, I, I think about how we don't even bat an eye anymore at the use of, of profanity and sexual innuendo in movies and television shows. Uh, but, I've shared my era, I guess, and I'm dating myself. The risque show was was Three's Company. And today that would seem tame. My parents didn't let me watch it. And I'm glad they didn't. That was a, a good decision on their part. You turn on the television today and it is so hard to find a television show or especially a movie where there isn't any of that there. And you just become numb to it. It, you know, glosses over. I think the use of God's name, oh my God, God, most egregious, very egregious breaking of the second commandment. And yet we find ourselves doing it all the time and not being reprimanded for it because it's a sin prevalent in the culture. You could go all kinds of directions now with, with marriage, right? Uh, sex outside of marriage, living together outside of those marriage, all of those things are sins that have become prevalent in the culture. And now to the extent that if you would do things God's way, you're seen as the strange or, or unusual person, and it makes it doubly hard for the Christian to live life as God wants them to. And you see a downhill trajectory. Sadly, it's something you see in families many, many times too. If there's a, a broken up family in one generation, the likelihood of the next generation uh, having a broken up family is more likely and more likely and more likely. And you see that trend continue. That doesn't mean that it's an automatic, but it is something that's noticeable. And that's the, the doubly you know, tricky thing, a uh, sad thing about sins like this that become pervasive in the culture, pervasive in the family. Then they continue to hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt. And to buck that trend, Christians then are singled out as being weird or strange or different. Is there anything Abraham could have done to prevent Isaac from repeating his mistake? That's a good question. Again, we don't even know if Isaac knew about what Abraham had done. The way families are, I, I kind of assume he probably did. But would it have been okay for Abraham to maybe take Isaac aside and say, you know, son, I want you to learn from things. I want you to learn from a few mistakes I've made in life and to walk him through those. That'd be humbling, but could it maybe have helped Isaac? Now, there's always the possibility Abraham did that, and Isaac didn't learn, had to learn the hard way, that we like to call it. Now, that happens too. But I think the point I want to make is it's okay to be humble, and especially with your adult children, to acknowledge sins that you've committed and learned from. It doesn't mean you, you sit with them and air out every awful sin or thing you've ever done or thought. That's probably counterproductive. But if there's a sin you committed that you really learned from and you don't want your children to repeat, take the time, sit down, and let them know. I, I know I, I personally have done that with a few. How do you go about helping your children learn from mistakes or mistakes that they might not know about or the mistakes of society without them losing respect for you? So there's a fine line, isn't there? Uh, maybe there are some things that, you don't want your children to know about you because they'll lose respect for you. You know, I guess finally you have to choose. But once they're adults, I think you can present that information in a way 
right? That, that doesn't necessarily taint your reputation. You might be surprised how it actually elevates your reputation in their eyes when they see that you're a humble Christian, even towards them. Now, I'm not talking about doing this with your 12-year-old, maybe even your younger teenager. But as your children mature into young men and women, there definitely is value in sharing those things and sharing how you've learned from them. We we'll continue on then, reading 16 through 35. When Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us, you become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug at the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there, but the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, this water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. It's what the word means. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one, so they named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well, and when no one had quarreled over it, he named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abram. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuza, his personal advisor, and Fecal, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, We saw clearly that the Lord was with you, so we said, There ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty that you will do us no harm, just as we did not molest you, but always treated you well and sent you away in peace. And now you are blessed by the Lord. So Isaac made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they left in peace. That day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug. They said, We found water. He called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beer Sheba. That means the well of Sheba. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and also Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief for Isaac and Rebekah. Remember the twin sons, Isaac and Jacob, Esau is the older. So how does God see Isaac and Rebekah through their faith challenges in spite of Isaac's sins? And how is that a comfort to us? You know, the Lord protects Rebekah like he had protected Sarah before her. And when Abimelech knows and finds out, he's respectful of that. Isaac and Rebekah and their family prosper in that land. And, and they grow into a larger and larger group of people. So much so that they're told, please go away. We don't want this conflict to elevate Abimelech. And those people from the Philistine region send them away. Very clearly, God had blessed them. And then you look at how... The neighboring kingdoms saw that and recognized that. You know, we, we've watched you and we know God is with you. We don't want to be against you. Uh, you might say uh, Isaac and Rebekah did let their light shine. And of course, God made the light shine by blessing them as well. But instances of mission work in the Old Testament, we see that all the time. How's that a comfort to us? You know, I'm sure that, that Isaac, as Abraham before him, felt some serious guilt knowing what he had done when he was reprimanded for it. And you think how Abimelech was the more honorable in that whole situation, someone who really didn't even know God well or appreciate him. But I, I think comfort to us knowing God still remains with them, still blesses them, still sees them through. And remember, isn't that what God is all about? His grace, his undeserved love for sinners. He doesn't just talk about it in the Bible. He shows it to us, just like he shows it to Isaac and Rebekah. So we don't have to go around worried that, oh, no, man, I really screwed up. Now God is going to curse me forever. Now nothing is going to go right in my life because God doesn't really love me because of the bad thing I did. That's not the way God operates. Not the way God operates. And that's a big comfort. How is trusting God's love and providence a challenge when Isaac 
when it came to finding a place to live and drink. Well, think of all the places he tried to settle, and then he would come into conflict, so he moved on, came into conflict, moved on. You know, did he get worried? Well, God, you made me this big promise about how I'm going to prosper, but every place I go, I get kicked out of. And God teaches him persistence, doesn't he? You know, God's promises and prayers aren't always answered in the time frame we think they should be exactly the way they should be. But ultimately, God answers them. Ultimately, God fulfills his promises and always in a way that blesses us. And Isaac saw that. You know, the end result was lands in that place near Beersheba and the other places which were wonderful places to live and ends up with a treaty of those who are trying to oppose him. How can we maintain our trust in God when he doesn't seem to be blessing us? I use this word often that God's track record. That you go back and watch. Go through the Bible again and see how God operates. This is a great example. He does it in his time, but he always does it in a beautiful and marvelous way that in retrospect, you look back and go, oh, yeah, I see what God was doing. The more life experience that you and I have, I think we can do that too. I can look back at my life and see God's track record in blessing, even through hard times, and maybe not answering prayers the way I wanted, right in the time frame that I wanted. But then in retrospect, you look back and go, oh, yeah, God, thank you for doing it way that, that way. That's exactly what I needed. We can trust that that track record God sets in the Bible and the track record he set forth in our experience, in our Christian faith, in our Christian walk, is a reminder that he's going to continue to do that as he has through all the ages and all the ups and downs and wars and peace times of history. He's going to keep doing that until Jesus comes back. That is a huge comfort. And it means that we live our lives differently as Christians. So as we continue, we we'll walk through the, the fallout, you might say, from the fall and, and the flood. And we see these tragic sins that they fall into. We also see God's grace right hand in hand along with them. Boy, these are people just like you and me with flaws. And yet God loves them and walks by their side and sends his son to forgive them. Let's close with prayer. Dear Lord, in our lives, when we fail and the guilt weighs on us, remind us that you're right there with your love and forgiveness. We ask that you would give us a trust to do what you wish, to follow your will and your precepts and commands, even when it, it doesn't result the way that we would want it to right away. Give us the trust that you're working through it. You'll see us through it, and the results will be to your glory and for our blessing. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Tune in again next week.